everybody. Welcome to another Vita Academy webinar. Today we've got uh, Eugene Rosengert. Hi, Eugene. How are you doing? I'm good, guys. I'm good. How are you doing? Uh, excellent. Excellent. So, so we got a large audience today, so which is good to hear. Always uh, welcome everybody. Uh, Eugene, thanks for uh, helping us out with this. Uh, today we're going over with Eugene uh, physiologic complete dentures setting teeth for proper functional aesthetics. Just a little bit about me. I, I live in Sandy, Utah, where I have my family, and I run an Apple Dental Laboratory. So I don't work uh, as an insurance in Utah because I'm licensed in Oregon. Uh, here I mostly do consulting uh, for University of Utah, uh, general practice residency. I, I work with the residents there on removal prosthodontics, so I get to actually still work in the mouth and stuff like this, which is very helpful. Uh, right here, if you look on the screen, you see my picture and you also see a little QR code there. That QR code has all my uh, kind of social media and contact information, so go ahead and scan it and uh, it'll be a lot easier for you guys to get a hold of me. Uh, like I always say, you know, give me a call, give me a text or something, and then I can block you guys and never have to deal with any questions <laughs> ever again. But uh, no, in all seriousness, uh, if you still have questions after this webinar, um, I'll be more than happy to answer whatever questions you guys have. Uh, social media is usually the best way to contact me, uh, but you can also send me a text message if you want. Okay. So today uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, physiological plate dentures and about the whole concept of how to fabricate and, and get the best possible results uh, for our patients with our prosthetics. Um, because oftentimes removable pros is, at least it was when I was, was first starting out, is viewed as kind of a uh, like a basic appliance, it was the, it was, you often hear it's just a denture kind of thing. But in reality, it's one of the most complicated uh, treatment modalities because of full mouth reconstruction and you're dealing with pretty much blank slate, right? So you're starting from nothing, starting from scratch, and it could be quite difficult and there's a lot of errors that you can make. So today, I'm going to try to go through some of the steps. I obviously can't go through all of the steps because there's just not enough time in a lifetime, I think, to go through all of the steps to have a complete, uh, perfectly made restoration. There's, there's, there's anatomy involved and there's, uh, you know, uh, fabrication involved. And I simply just don't know all of it, right? Uh, we always work and we learn and we get better, with hopefully, with each day and we keep learning. That's why we do these webinars. That's why we attend courses and we get degrees and stuff like that. So I often use this picture in the majority of my lectures. Some of you guys have seen this as the Leaning uh, Tower of Pisa. And uh, the reason why I show this picture is because you can have the most beautiful restoration. You can have the most beautiful prosthesis. And I don't care if it's acrylic, right, if it's porcelain, zirconia, whatever it might be. But if the foundation is not stable, that whole restoration is going to be problematic. Okay. Now, in this case, some people can say, well, but maybe, you know, it, the structure is so strong that the foundation doesn't matter because it's still standing. But in our case, it's uh, definitely a problem. Okay, so some of the common issues that I see in completed mobile prosthetics. Uh, so we're not getting enough lip support from the upper teeth, right? Because we either have either too much or not enough. Because when you're looking at your patients, and this is more for the clinical guys, don't just look facially. Don't just, just look at the incisal display. Go ahead and look at the profile of your patient. Look at that nasal labial angle. Is it too protruded or if it's not providing enough support? Adjust that from there. Now, your technicians are providing you with a wax rim, but that wax rim is just an approximation. And we'll talk a little bit about the, um, the areas of the wax rim that uh, need to be a certain way in order to for make it for clinicians to adjust them easier, okay? Unstable lower dentures. That particular issue is not only related to the patient because oftentimes we say, you know what, uh, I hear this all the time, it's a lower denture, they're unstable to begin with. Yes, in some cases when you have severely compromised and severely resorbed residual ridges, yes, it's going to be unstable. However, I see cases a lot of times when the patient have fairly good uh, mandibular bone levels 
and the dentures are still jumping all over the place. That has to do with the fabrication process, more importantly with impressions and stuff like this. We'll talk about this today as well. Insufficient buccal quarters. Insufficient buccal quarters is something that's not as easy as it sounds, okay? Uh, that's why we're going to talk today about uh, model analysis because you can't just simply bring out the posterior teeth outward in order to close those buccal quarters. There are certain regions, there are certain areas that you can place the teeth in, okay? So aesthetics doesn't always follow function, okay? And they don't always go, go hand in hand. Sometimes something is going to be pleasant aesthetically, but it won't be working as a functional prosthesis, okay? Improper tooth selection. Um, there are several ways that we select teeth and there's literature on that where you can look at the um, actual patient's form of the arch and choose according to that. But the more I do this for a living, the more experience I gain, the more I talk to people, the more anecdotal evidence that I see. I think tooth selection is has more to do with individuality of the patient rather than their arch form. So there will be cases where you know you have a square formed arch or square tapered arch but an ovoid shaped tooth would look better for this particular patient, okay? And then flat gingival contours. Now flat gingival contours are not necessarily a, a, a bad thing. Um, you get patients that are have severe hygiene issues and uh, oftentimes that creates a problem and if you uh, if you do if you do have very contoured denture, it will be become a, a plaque trap. So for some patients, you want to have minimal uh, contour or flat for some for some of them. But for others, you know, you want subtle contours. You don't want them to be completely flat or completely um, uh, aggressive. Uh, there's a, the combination of both is what you you tr you strive to achieve. For me personally, I haven't gotten to that point yet. I, I have still to do a denture where I'm 100% happy with the gingival contours. But I think it's most of us, to be honest with you guys. Okay, communication is definitely the key. You know, you can't produce a proper restoration if you don't have a team approach to um, to the restoration. Now, and I don't I don't just mean technician and the, uh, and, and the clinician. I also mean the patient. Uh, because everybody needs to be on the same page. The patient, the patient needs to know what what you can and cannot do. The patient needs to address their concerns, what they want, and everything else. Your and your first appointments are the very important because you need to establish that relationship. Okay, make sure you provide uh, communication with the lab and with the uh, with the clinic. Um, cases that I don't do myself, cases that I do, I send out. I make sure to not just write in the notes what I want. What I've started doing actually, I, I use a couple of different applications. I use uh, Loom on my phone to record a video and then I use a, a QR code generator to create a QR code to that video link. So when I'm sending a lab slip to a lab, oftentimes when it's a complex case, I'll record a video explaining all the little nuances on the case and I'll attach a QR code to the lab slip and I'll say please scan for additional video information. That makes it a lot easier to communicate with your lab. Okay. Uh, and on the lab side, if you are not sure of something, if you need to ask a question, please ask that question because it's a lot easier to make that phone call or send that email rather than remaking the whole case because you had a little miscommunication, okay? Now, if you're dealing a lot of times, uh, when you're dealing with removal process and you're dealing with younger doctors that are fresh out of school, unfortunately, uh, in our in our present times, the amount of education spent on removal prosthodontics and dental schools is um, is somewhat lacking. So you get a lot of these clinicians who do not know all the necessary information in order to provide the proper restoration. So uh, oftentimes it's up to the lab to provide that education if you want to retain these clients. It's it's kind of a catch-22 here, okay? All right, guidelines for maxillary initial impression. What I, um, basically, I want to capture as much of anatomy as possible without going overboard. I don't need an esophageal impression on the patient, okay? But I do need the proper vestibular uh, zones. I need to see all the tuberosities. I need to see the area of the posterior parallel seal that I'll be carving in later. And um, an overextended initial impression allows me 
to create the best possible custom tray. Now, when I say overextended, I don't mean it's like so overextended that I don't see any kind of thing. You know, if 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 I push things out way too much, I won't even see the free now or anything else like this. Um, and I'll talk to you about uh, a couple of different ways that I take impressions to get best possible results uh, for the initial impressions. Uh, for the Mac, uh, for the mandibular, same thing. I need to make sure um, I extend it over uh, on the buccal zones. I go fairly deep in, in there below the mylohyoid ridge. I want to make sure that uh, my uh, retromolar pads are present and, and, are, and are not distorted. And all of these things are kind of important when we're fabricating our custom trays. Just like what I showed you guys on the initial slide, if you don't have a proper foundation, your restoration is going to suffer. Okay, so each step that you're working on is the most important step in the restoration. Just because it's just an initial impression, just for a custom tray, it's it's not that simple, guys. It's an initial impression. It's a custom tray. These are very very important steps. If you mishandle those steps, you're going to create problems. Okay. Now, when you receive something like this, that's automatically an issue. The uh, the story behind this, the patient was a gagger. They weren't able to get proper impression. Also, they had the severely procline, procline anteriors. There are things that you can do. There are adjustments that you can make in order to capture the uh, restoration. Uh, nowadays, with, with scanners, it makes things a little bit easier because you don't have to hold that thing, all that goop in there. Uh, but even if you're not using a scanner, now for this particular case, you need to be adjusting your trays. I see too many times they take a tray out of the box and it's a small, medium, large, and there are no adjustments made to trays. I highly recommend using disposable trays because you can trim them, you can add to them, which compound, thermoplastic beads, uh, rope wax, whatever you need to add in order to get as, as, as good of a fit as possible with those initial trays. Things like this, where you're not uh, capturing the, the tuberosity, you know, uh, you can see that the tray was too far forward. It, it wasn't going back far enough. There could have been some pour up issues here as well. Okay. See this fairly often. If you use a stock tray, stock dentate tray on an edentulous patient, you're going to run into those retromolar pads right away. And with retromolar pads, you try to keep those as undisturbed as possible in order to create a proper seal. So if you keep, don't get a good initial impression, you, you, you're that much, uh, you create that much more problems for you when you fabricate a custom tray, when you fabricate a final impression, and so on and so forth. Okay, same thing here. It's a combination of two things. You got that dentate tray and also improper pour-up techniques. So you need to make sure you're utilizing proper fabrication techniques, not just in the impression, but also when you're pouring things up. Now, in this case, we used uh, a little bit of, uh, not a little bit, we actually used a ton of uh, silicone putty in order to extend the tray upward, okay? And then taking the impression. And I'm using two types of alginate a lot of times because I have my alginate that is uh, Zermac, uh, Hydrogum 5, it's the, the, the one that's stable for five days. And I'm using my um, uh, neocolloid. Now, Hydrogum 5, is, is, it's a good algin, but when you use proper uh, mixing ratios, it's going to be nice and stiff. So it's going to create a lot of volume, but it's also going to push the tissues away. But neocolloid, it has a longer setting time. It's more of an injectable material. So you can get nice peripheral anatomy with it and you get a good overextended, obviously, impression, but at the same time, you have a lot of you know, nuances that can be shown in it, okay? And here, I've also marked the uh, posterior paddle seal, so when I make the, uh, the custom tray, I don't make it go too far back, okay? Now, with the lower trays, you see how we've cut out the distal regions here, so we're trying to minimize the pressure on retromolar pads, and we're trying to um, get the most non-disturbed impression for them because you know achieving suction on the on the mandible is a lot more labor intensive than it is in the maxilla okay and with the lower a lot of times i'll take a little bit if i'm in the clinic i'll take a little bit of uh, alginate and i'll create a little you know coverage for tongue space and here i'm also marking an approximation of where the base plate will be you don't always have to do that part 
okay? Now, this is the uh, neocolloid that I use for the injectable portion, and this is the Hydrogon 5 that I use for the tray, okay? And these are the 60cc um, catheter chip syringes. These are non-dental specific. I just buy them on Amazon. Uh, because they're non-dental specific, it makes them a lot cheaper that way as well, and they work wonderfully intraorally, okay? These trays, uh, these are called uh, frame cutback trays. Um, they're, um, I think they were invented by Dr. Uh, Jiro Abe, if I'm not mistaken, and they're specifically made to uh, to have these areas right here to be cut out distally so you're not disturbing the retromolar zones too much. And also, if you look at the lateral view, it's got a fairly nice cutout here to minimize pressure on the buckle shelf. And, and uh, also, the handle is bent out so you can provide proper lip bending and stuff like this so you don't over bulge things too much okay but if you don't have those you can actually take a regular stock tray and dr abi does talk about in his books uh, and you can modify that as you can see right here i modified the handle like this could be a little bit of an issue here maybe i should have carved this a little bit more but i also cut back the distal zones actually did i no i don't have another picture of this of this particular tray uh, but I've cut back the distal zones, as you could see in the previous picture, or you can see right here, to accommodate retromolar pads. And I also reduced the buckle shelf area here to take another impression that's going to give me all the areas that I need and not disturb the ones that I don't want to disturb. Okay. Also, you get these uh, massage trays that are edentulous trays, that are thermoforming trays, which are great. You can make adjustments to those whichever way you need. You can trim them, you can cut them, you can bend them. And, and, and go from there. And you can use some type of compound. In this case, it's the GCI, it's a functional compound I was using. Uh, I haven't used that material for a while, but it was a good a good material. Um, Cost-wise, I'm not 100% sure that's the most cost-effective, uh, but the quality, because it was a softer and uh, material, it worked really, really well uh, for alginate uh, contouring and stuff like this, as well as the final impressions, okay? So when I'm dealing with patients, I, I want to make sure to visualize things, and I want to see what my uh, areas look like, where the uh, where the residual ridge is, uh, how well I can uh, adapt the tray and everything else. So make sure you check and double check things. Obviously, initially you want to uh, check uh, oral health. You do your uh, soft tissue exams. You look for any abnormalities and everything else like this. But also, when you do take an actual impressions, you want to make sure to make all the proper and necessary adjustments to the anatomy that the patient has. If you look in there and the patient has, uh, you know, mandibular tori, mandibular lingual tori that are pretty aggressive, maybe using compound in those areas is, is not a good idea. Speaking from experience, when I was in school and we had to take a bunch of impressions on ourselves, and I have pretty aggressive lingual tori. And I border molded the tray with, you know, that nice and warm compound when I was going in. And then the stuff cools down and you got an undercut and you just cut yourself there. And you're going, oh, I'm trying to get this out and you can't get it out. So please kind of view these things and be careful with it. Okay. There are several different designs of custom trays. Uh, custom uh, trays can be close fitting. They can be with a spacer and they can be windowed if you have like a severely uh, resorbed mandible or maxilla um uh, oftentimes you'll see this in the maxilla actually rather than the mandible in kelly combination syndrome cases where the patient is was fully edentulous on the um, on the maxilla and just had um k9 to k9 on the uh, mandible or maybe a little bit longer and had this extension partial there um a lot of times when the patients don't wear their uh maxillary denture and they're just always biting into that ridge uh, you create inflammation resorption, you have overgrown tissue there. And even with dentures, when you're biting on those areas, you'll get that really um, a lot of tissue in the front and you'll get those hanging tuberosities in the posterior. Um, different materials require different thicknesses. Um, oftentimes, what I use is just uh, polyvinyl selexin for my impression. But if you're making trays for alginate, they're going to look different than trays for um uh for an elastomeric material okay i don't generally use zinc oxide eugenol paste but there's a lot of people there are a lot of people that still use that uh especially in europe i see this a lot in italy and stuff uh, personally it takes wonderful impressions but uh, it's not very technician friendly let's put it that way majority of the trays i use clinically 
initially I was trained to use uh, traceable the spacer um, but nowadays over the years I've decided to kind of change my technique and nowadays I use a, a closer fitting tray not a, an, an exact close fitting tray I use a one millimeter spacing because I design my digitally and I'll do tissue stops just enough so I don't have too much pressure in certain areas I want to be able to control it with tissue stops so I don't end up creating a lot of pressure on the incisive papilla and the palatal rugae because if you create too much pressure inside the papilla you can cause you know um, some ischemia some some issues there and, and things like this so I do a closer fitting tray but not a complete close tray okay now in order to create the best possible custom tray for the mandible on the maxilla things are a little bit more simple you, you try to go away from the, the vestibule about two millimeters and you always 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 and I can't say this enough you always want to muscle trim everything chair side your technician can only create a tray that is an approximation of what uh, the uh, the tray needs to be because we follow certain landmarks and if they are not exact and if they're not visible we can overextend things or we can even actually shorten things too much so if you look at your tray it's overextended in the mouth go ahead and adjust it but if it's too short go ahead and add some compound in those areas as well now, especially if you're using a you know a space trays that are severely uh going to be severely trimmed back and things like this as well i see that a lot of times and because those are there for a reason because um a lot of times a lot of schools are using compound for border molding so that's, those trays need to be shorter because if you have a tray that's overextended or not shorten enough and use compound you're going to push those tissues out of the way and you're going to have a border that's that thick okay now for my static outline we're using certain landmarks on the mandible in order to create an approximation for our custom trays so when we're actually fitting it it's going to give us the best possible results to get a suction denture on the bottom okay or not a suction denture i don't want to use that term because i think it's actually might be trademarked a denture with a lower uh, lower de uh, mandibular denture with a suction let's put it that way okay so we don't always get good impressions for the mandible and oftentimes we don't and even if we have visibly have the landmarks there it's, you got the retromolar pad zones and you got your uh you know the vestibule a lot of times we're using very thick algae and everything's pushed out of the way so i'm not seeing frina here very well um it's just everything's kind of washed out so these landmarks for my static out outline excuse me are going to be an approximation but if you get a better impression you get see those marks a lot uh, a lot better now for this tray as you can see uh, for this impression as you can see only hydrogum 5 was used and you can see it's kind of pushed out of the way we don't see a lot of anatomy definition here but if we use combination of hydrogum and neocolloid ah completely different picture right we can see the uh the buccal uh tissue a lot better we can see a little rippling in there of the, of the tissue and everything else okay and uh here we have our mandible impression and you can see right here i had a little bit of a show through on the tray which is not a huge problem because we are still making a custom tray for this uh but it's something to be aware of there's two things you can do from here you can either just trim the tray and re retake the impression or make a note of that and and kind of trim back your uh custom tray in that area to uh not not affect that zone okay so if we look right here hi right, folks so i just wanted to show you this so we took a couple of impressions on this patient the original uh, impression was hopefully you guys can hear the audio hydrogram five and you see there's not a lot of detail i mean it's a really good impression just a little bit of a retromolar area is missing here uh, but uh, the tissue is kind of just pushed out and uh, you can't really tell where the mucosa is and where the everything else is. But if you do take this one right here, uh, this is a, a mixture of... Uh, you guys can see that we, it's all very nicely extended. It's going below the mylohyoid ridge because we want to extend the denture just slightly below that. I can see the very good definition of the buccal vestibule and such. Okay, So we're going to go from there. Now, once we've poured up that model, we can see, you know, all the buccal frena. We can see the, you know, the um, the buccal landing area for where where we want to uh, 
have our denture resting in it. We don't want to go too far down because if you look at this and if you go by uh, our school uh, education where they go, you know, go to the bottom of the um, vestibule and go two millimeters short from that. So if you go to the bottom of the vestibule here on the mandible and go two millimeters short from that, you're still going to be overextended and you're not going to be able to achieve good stability for this particular case. Okay. So uh, the way they usually teach you to do the myostatic outline was to mark the crest of the ridge, which I, in real life, I don't ever do, but this is more of a textbook definition of things. And then you mark the retromolar pads, right? Now, retromolar pads are obviously important for everything else, so we do mark those. Uh, Mylohyoid ridge is that ridge, if it's not visible to you right away, kind of slightly turn the model, you'll see where the undercut starts showing up. That's gonna be your uh, mylohyoid ridge. Um, because I do my trace digitally mostly, it's kind of easy to see because when you set your path of insertion, the software will block the undercuts and you'll see below that is, uh, I mean, uh, above the undercut is going to be where your mylohyoid ridge is, okay? Now, the uh, marking the ex uh, ex external oblique ridge is not always very visible. That's why this is an approximation. We're always going to be adjusting this trace chair side. But on that previous inversion that I showed you, you can kind of see where it ends, and that's where you're going to uh, mark, mark the external oblique ridge right there. So right here is going to be your external oblique ridge. It could actually be a little lower as well, but I generally try to go shorter because I'll also have material here. I'll have medium body or heavy body, depending on how short I went, in order to capture this a little bit better. Okay. Now, the mentalis muscle. The mentalis muscle is the best possible landmark uh, for residual ridges uh, that have been uh, for uh, they've been resorbed quite a bit because even if you got a severely resorbed mandible oftentimes you'll see those mentalis muscles and that's going to give you uh, that approximation outline for your mandibular denture now you want to uh, obviously make it about halfway down the mentalis muscle because it does flex so you don't want to, to throw the uh, denture out of your patient's mouth so it usually goes about halfway down the mentalis muscle for the anterior portion okay then we're going to mark the labial frenum hopefully they're going to be visible and if you have any visible uh lingual frenum you also want to mark it as well now here you it's fairly visible and we mark it and we want to make sure to avoid that because it's going to destabilize our denture but in some cases like you can see right here it won't be visible okay so next thing we're going to do is we're going to we mark uh, about one third uh, of the mentalis muscle or half. You know what? Measuring one third of mentalis is, is kind of difficult. So I just usually just kind of split it in the middle and go from that point. And, uh, and we'll connect that um, halfway up through the, through the labial freedom and make that interior portion of our custom tray. Okay. Now, the, the distal of the mentalis muscle and uh, the buccal freedom you want to avoid that area right there. So you can make that connection here. And then further back, you're going to see that um, connection to your retromolar pads. Now we're going about halfway up the retromolar pads for the, uh, for the custom tray uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, reason number one, your tissue for retromolar pad is the most stable uh, when you are, uh, when you're taking impressions about halfway up. Um, the retromal pad. Once you once you go going above that, and you start putting a lot of pressure on it, um, then it's going to destabilize that. And so when I make dentures, a lot of times I will go about halfway up the retromal pad. The second thing is that oftentimes you'll get a um, an impression, initial impression, where the patient had uh, their mouth completely open. When you open your mouth, you stretch that retromal pad quite a bit. So going up all the way up. Um, it's actually going to be going into your maxilla almost. So that's another reason why we go halfway up. On those lower trays that I showed you guys, those are designed to have your patient close down when you're taking the impression because that's going to give you the best possible uh, view of the retromolar pads um, when you take that impression. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, please ask questions and we'll kind of try to revisit it at the end. Okay. Now, oh, sorry, let me go back. I didn't, I didn't cover this part. So when you go halfway up, you mark your mile higher ridge like we talked about, right? And then you connect that like with a semicircle um, 
or with a crescent uh, to the middle of the retromolar pad on this side. Okay, and then you try to do the outline along the um, uh, along the lingual. And if you have any kind of uh, lingual free net, obviously you want to avoid that as well. So in the front, we kind of look right there, and uh, the connections are made from the external oblique ridge where we marked right there, avoiding that uh, area going about 15 degrees above the uh, the buccal frena, connecting to mentalis muscle, bisecting it, and going all the way around, okay? And making sure that we got our retromolar pads about halfway up, especially if they're overextended. So the masseter attachment is gonna be right here, the uh, the actual myelohyoid muscle is going to be right right there, and we got our vaccinator, or I used to call it buccinator for many many years. <laughs> I guess it's not a, a pirate thing, so it's a buccinator. I'm assuming, or maybe some people do say buccinator. Maybe I was right half the time. Um, and we get the depressor anguli oris muscle right here. So those are kind of all drawn out for you guys, so you can see it as well as the mentalis muscle. Now, obviously, you don't need to be drawing out on your models, but this is a good way to kind of learn things and to approximate things. So when you follow those parameters and when you go uh, go here, now with this tray, we had a, a fully uh, patient was fully closed when we took the impression. So I decided, to be honest with you guys, I decided to cover the entire uh, retromolar pad for this patient. And, and the reason why I did this, because I was actually present uh, for this particular patient, and I wasn't too worried about needing to trim it if it was a little too tall. Um, but if you guys are, you can make these shorter. The it kind of varies. I'll be honest with you. There's some literature out there that says you know take your trays about halfway up the retromolar pad or three quarters, and some will say cover cover it completely. What I usually say, if you get the best possible results uh, with this way then go ahead and do it that way. If your technique needs to be adjusted, go ahead and adjust it. I generally, in my own cases, if I'm fairly comfortable and, I'm, and, I, and I look at things and, and the retromolar pads don't look too distorted from the initial impression, I'll cover the whole thing. And if then I'm, if I'm seeing issues, I'll trim it back, okay? But for this patient, as you can see, now we're avoiding the lingual freedom. We're making sure that it's a couple of millimeters, um, two millimeters below the myelohyoid ridge and we're nice and short in the buccal shelf and not too long on the interior as well. Go back so you can get to see there. So mentalis muscle, we're about halfway up, and obviously I'm still going to muscle trim this chair side, okay? So this is just an approximation. So I took this tray, I muscle fitted it to this particular patient, and uh, lo and behold, to my surprise actually, I was, I was pretty surprised for this particular case, um, we got pretty good suction with just the tray alone. Now this is going to be in Russian because the patient is Russian speaking, and I'm, and I'm because I grew up in southern Ukraine, I mostly spoke Russian there. Um, as you can see, the tray has suction, right? So that's the whole idea. You try to make the best possible fitting restoration. Now you can actually probably take this tray, cut the handle off and use it for a by trim, but we decided to take, you know, a little wash impression to adapt it even better, okay? So close mouth impression, I think it's the best way to capture everything without causing any issues. And you can also, when when you do close mouth impression, you're doing functional movements, it's a lot easier for the patient to, you know, to move their tongue against that handle to create that nice lingual uh, shape for your impression and everything else. For the mouth impressions um, that are open mouth impressions, obviously you can see things a lot better. You can control the situation. You can control the pressure. You're holding things in. Um, but with me over the years, I just haven't had the best possible results with it. I'll be honest with you guys. So that's why I switched to, according to Dr. Abe's techniques and, and looking at other uh, clinicians and technicians, um, I decided to go with, with, with that. But if you look at the books, there are so many different things out there and there's so much research and it's all theoretical because these are all theories, right? We, we try them in practice. Some people get great results, some people don't. So my suggestion to you guys, use the technique that you get the best possible results. If it's working for you, you don't have to do what I do. So I'm just showing you the ways that I do things and maybe they might work for you down the line. 
okay? Now, a lot of times we take, obviously, impressions for partially dentate or fully dentate patients. And for partially dentate patients, when we're, we're fabricating RPDs, and we, if we're doing custom trays or no custom trays, but if we're doing polyvinyl and the angulation of teeth is severely proclined, for example, we've got this huge undercut and we've got medium or heavy body going into the undercut, a lot of times you're going to end up locking that tray and then you're going to have to grind, grind that thing out. I've noticed over the years, and I was a huge opponent of using alginate for uh, taking RPD impressions, but I've noticed over the years, when we take a good alginate impression, like with a combination of uh, hydrogon 5 and, and, and neocolloid or whatever system you guys are using, right, to get a nice impression like this, for example, and you pour it up obviously within reasonable time and you're using proper you know type 5 stone i've seen adaptation of partial frameworks fit a lot better with these cases than it does with polyvinyl that's just my personal experience and also if you have a patient with severely proclined teeth algin works a little bit better because it's, it's slightly more elastic and you're able to remove it without tearing things apart or having to cut the tray so that's something to consider my friends okay now there's some things you want to do before taking impressions, okay, before taking final impressions in this particular case. Now, ideally, you want the patient to remove dentures for 24 to 48 hours before taking impressions, but if you can see on the bottom, it says almost never happens, right? Because you get these patients that have never taken their dentures out, right? And you get to see cases like this, where you have, you know, gingival uh, stomatitis, so we get, it's a fungal infection that needs to be treated, actually because you don't let the tissue breathe, you don't let the tissue heal, and obviously, obviously it's going to be compressed. But when you're dealing with patients that never take their dentures out, um, chances are they're gonna take it out down the line anyways. So a lot of times we'll just capture that form. But if the tissue is severely over compressed and you take impressions and then the patient takes their te teeth out down the line and, and the tissue rebounds, a lot of times you're gonna have fit issues. So that's something to kind of put in your back pocket to think about, okay? Make sure tissue is free from denture adhesive. For some reason, denture adhesive is the most horrible thing when it comes to impressions. Number one, you can't see it intraorally because it, it blends with tissue a lot of times because it's pink a lot of times. And then it sticks to everything. And then if you're unfortunate enough to capture that into your impression and you don't clean it out, first of all, you can have a distortion. And the second most annoying thing is that the stone is going to be washed out in that area. So you're going to have an, a, a a model that's just completely completely doesn't look like it needs to look okay dry tissue with gauze before taking a vps impression now you don't, don't have to go overboard and it doesn't necessarily have to be gauze you would just want to make sure that it doesn't have a lot of saliva so it just doesn't float in everywhere you want to make sure you, you kind of semi dry in that not spots because in those spots because uh, a lot of impression materials are actually hydrophilic they're, they're not going to be affected by moisture but for better results for better detail you want to have a, a, a drier field you won't have absolutely dry field but a drier field will work a little bit better now with this picture it just talks about every different area uh, that you want to capture for, from the impressions and these slides were given to me many many years ago uh, by a fellow denturist uh, from UK if I remember correctly I don't remember their name I apologize but um, credit goes entirely to them. When you guys have an ability to view this webinar down the line, go ahead and take a screenshot of this or message me. Maybe I can take you, uh, send you the actual file for it. It's something good to have. I'm sorry. It doesn't just show you the areas you need to capture. It also tells you the movements you need to go through in order to capture those areas, okay, which is really nice. And the same thing you're going to see for the maxilla. So it's a wonderful cheat sheet. To, to study and to go through steps to take the best possible impression, okay? Some of the areas that we have problems with when taking impressions, right? Right here, you see, you got all these steps right there. Well, basically what happened here, the uh, clinician used just heavy body for the entire for the entire impression. Obviously that doesn't take very, because it's so viscous, it doesn't take very good detail. And they put a little bit of light body though, but it wasn't enough to capture things. And also you can see a lot of kind of bulky overextension a little bit in some areas like right here. Okay, here we got an opposite issue, right? We got a border molded impression, but it's a perforated tray. And a perforated tray with, um, with light body is just gonna leak all out, okay? 
I, I don't generally do perforated trays for uh, close fitting and even slightly spaced impressions, uh, simply because I want to see that suction. And if I am gonna do a perforation, it's probably gonna be uh, right behind the incisive papilla just to decompress that area. So I'm not any causing any ischemic issues down the line. But most of the time it's just flat. You see this kind of a reline repair problem, right? Uh, yeah, this probably would have worked, but one thing didn't happen. What? They didn't use adhesive. So if I go to try to pull this up, it's just gonna be a mess. Okay, so using proper adhesive for your impressions is also important. Now you see tray design is also, if you mess up on tray design, now here the tray is too short. Combination of impression materials, if you don't provide proper pressure, you're gonna get these steps. So that's why I try to minimize things. You know, usually I border mold with medium body if I'm border molding, uh, and then I'll use light body for the base of the impression, and I try to flow it out all the way to the periphery so it's all kind of uh, monolithic. And if I'm having so, uh, some areas I need to add to, I'll try to add extra light viscosity impression material and provide enough pressure so it kind of blends, blends better. But if you don't, you're gonna end up with steps and bubbles. Here you can also see the tray wasn't trimmed properly because you see that show through when they take an impression? That means when you're doing labial movements, it was hitting the tray. So it's gonna cause some problems down the line. Here you can see the same thing. You got major bubbles, you got steps and everything associated with it. My favorite modality when taking uh, final impressions is actually utilizing patient's existing denture. Now, back in the day before we had digital technology, it was kind of a pain because in order to do that step, you either had to take the patient's denture and adjust it to take the impression because oftentimes when you take a patient's existing denture, they're kind of used to that denture. Um, but because of the resorption factors associated with things, denture borders don't change unless you adjust them, but the ridge resorbs and the denture borders are gonna be what? Overextended, right? And if you take an impression with that, you're gonna have a overextended impression. But if you take that denture and you adjust it, it's their denture, right? You adjust it. Even if it's the worst denture ever and the patient says, oh, it's a piece of junk, I never use it, it sits in the, in the desk drawer somewhere or in a nightstand, the second you take pick up a burr and you start adjusting the borders, it becomes the best denture you, they've ever had and you just ruined it for them. So I don't like doing that. I like to utilize a, a copy of the patient denture, which is mine. I can adjust it any which way I want and I can use it uh, for, any, for things necessary. Now, sometimes when things are too far gone, maybe we won't use it, but for majority of cases, I still would like to use a bed denture to take an impression um, rather than start from the beginning because I think it still makes a very good custom tray. And if we can't utilize it for bites uh, or vertical dimension, I, I still can utilize it to make it a, a fairly decent uh, custom tray and a bite trim down the line, okay? Now, before before digital, we had to do it by hand. It kind of took, took forever. Now I just scan it and then print a replica and it, it doesn't take a lot of time and a lot of cost and it's very nice. Okay, so we can just print that. That particular one, you can see a little bit of a cutback. This is just a temporary denture um, that I was gonna be uh, using a little bit of a gingival um, contouring on. Okay, now when you're using a duplicate denture, if the patient is, a, is able to wear that and take it home with them for at least a day, and you are not just doing a chair side and taking that right away from them, I would recommend using some kind of um, tissue conditioner because <clears throat> With tissue conditioners, they don't set up right away. What they basically do is they set up over the period of 24 hours. So if you take an impression with it, or basically just do like a soft reline with it, with a duplicate denture, have the patient wear that for 24 hours. They will border mold that for you themselves when they're talking, when they're laughing, when they're eating, they're just gonna border mold everything. So you have a, a lot better functional impression than you would doing something with polyvinyl chair set. Now, if you're doing it with that, now in this particular case, I was using a patient's existing denture to just stabilize their tissue. So this is not for an impression, but the idea is kind of the same. So you see there, I'm seeing some show through. So I need to adjust that first, okay? Clean everything up. And then I just peeled the rest of it out and I took a new kind of an impression and send the patient with it to wear for up to two weeks. You don't wanna have them longer, wear that longer than two weeks because all the things inside the, um, the elastomers, inside the soft tissue conditioner are going to start evaporating and it's gonna start becoming hard. So 
you want it to be the, the sta as stable as possible. Usually I tell the patients from 24 hours up to about a week is fine, okay? Now, also when you're using duplicate dentures, a lot of times they're gonna be deficient. In this particular case, we were missing a very large zone of the retromolar pads. So I was using compound here, but oftentimes nowadays I'll, I'll use thermoplastic beads and I'll show you in a second to extend things. You can see how much we had to extend our denture here. Now, this is my go-to material nowadays because it it's works just like compound, but it's not as brittle as compound. So it's a lot easier to use, okay? They're little beads, you just put them in hot water and then uh, I put them in little, um, they're actually uh, cotton um, tea bags that I use because if you just throw them in the, in, the, in, the, in the water bath, they'll actually stick to the water bath. So you want some kind of backing on there. Now, synthetic gauze doesn't work very well because it'll stick to the synthetic gauze. So you can either use like uh, natural cotton gauze or cheesecloth, or I just use these little uh, cotton bags uh, that are made for tea because I can just drop those beads in there and it works great for that, okay? But you can see for this patient, uh, I was actually uh, evaluating his existing lower denture and we determined it was too short. And that's why we weren't getting any stability. But by extending it with uh, thermoplastic compound or thermoplastic beads in this case, we we're actually able to obtain suction for this patient. Okay. As you can see right here, just by adding those things to it, nothing else. We didn't uh, do any kind of wash impression yet or anything else. Just by adding those extension and forming them, check this out. We get suction just with those. Okay. Okay, when you're pouring up impressions, also very important step, okay? A couple of things you need to consider. Doing a proper box and bead technique, not just for final impressions, I often do it for initial impressions as well, will give you the best possible results because you can get the proper borders. When you're pouring your stone in this direction, all the extra moisture and all the air goes upwards so you don't have, um, hopefully you don't have distortion and the antaglial surface, okay, um, of things. And this just makes for a easier way to fabricate a landing area and all of the things. It, it may, it's also a very easily teachable technique, okay, because you're using a magnetic strip in this case, using some uh, kind of doughy material. I use R-Time dough, which is fairly inexpensive and reusable for these kind of things, okay. And then you just mark the, if you're not sure where to, extend how far down extend the, the the putty you just mark it with a sharpie on the impression to, you know you mark that three to five millimeters whatever you want to use i usually mark about three to three millimeters down okay and you box it up and then you just measure your powder measure your liquid mix everything in the vacuum mixer and you just start adding a little by little and i teach people in a day how to make a really good model work so it's not really that difficult okay so like i said before you know you can do that with audience as well okay Cast, your master casts are important. It's not that basic, it's not that simple, right? You need things in order to evaluate things. You need things to, to show you where the borders are so you don't over trim anything. If you don't have a landing area, a lot of times you have over trimmed everything into your uh, the buccal vestibule, the area that the clinician spent all that time trying to capture to get the best possible seal, especially for, mon for, mon for mandible, <laughs> can't, can't talk. And if you over trim it, then you, what? You lost your serious, you lost your suction and you got a very upset clinician. Landing area, five to six millimeters. Maybe five to six is, could be too much. To me, I like it. If it's too, if it's too big, you can always trim it later when you're flasking the case. The bigger the landing area, the more stable things are gonna be when you're flasking. If you're using pressure flasks, like all brass flasks, this way, when you're closing things, you're not going to fracture that little thin area um if it's like two three millimeters okay and also it's going to allow you to show your clinician things you know you can mark things for the stop areas and everything else like this okay the depth of the sulcus you want to have three to four millimeters i generally look at the undercut zones right if it starts going undercut slightly above that i'll just go cut it down so you don't end up locking end up locking your, your base plate when you're fabricating it the height of the cast you want to be 10 to 15 millimeters here it says 15 millimeters textbook also, why? Because when you're deflasking, uh, not deflasking, when you're removing it from the uh, from the mounting of the reticulator, and you're causing causing a little bit of trauma to that cast, you don't want to just fracture that base in half. Now, if it's very thin, and you put your knife there and you hit it with a hammer or whatever you're using to def uh, to demount, 
you can fracture those casts. Also, when you're processing the cases, if you're using a lot of pressure on things, your cast can crack and cause a little micro uh, issues uh, in your actual denture. Okay. This particular thing, vibrating line, eight millimeters to the back, I don't generally follow that very often. I just kind of go not too far back. That that's my technique, not too far back. Because if you go aggressively like it is here, a lot of times your your cast won't fit in the tray and in, in, in the flask down the line. Okay. Now I often I wouldn't say I always because there's different cases, but I often carve in majority of my cases I will carve the uh, posterior parallel seal right before I make the base plates because I generally don't use my base plates for uh, taking final impressions like a BPS technique I'll carve my posterior parallel seal right away. Okay. Now wax rim designs also very very important step. You don't want them to be too huge. You don't want them to be too small. Uh, you want uh, this picture. This is one of mine actually, but it's been around, around the social media for a long time and everybody used it um, and I'm happy they are using it because it's a it's a good teaching tool. You, know, you want 22 millimeters on the maxilla, 18 millimeters on, on the mandible and the anterior zone. And I try to shape the anterior portion about 80 millimeters, uh, 80 degrees, sorry, 80 millimeters. Uh, now if you go less than that, it's not a huge problem, but the reason we do 80 is because of this, you know. You want to be able to get the best possible lip support with things. Now, if you've done too much, they can always carve it back. If it's not enough, they can always add to it. But some clinicians are spending a lot of time doing these things, and uh, they want to minimize the chair side time as much as possible in order to do that. Okay. This is a great tool. It's called a papillometer. I don't see this used enough, and I'll be honest with you guys, when I'm doing clinical stuff, um, I also forget to use it, but if you do have the ability to use it, uh, I think this is a Kangular one. The uh, Masad also makes them as well. Uh, the, basically, the way it works is you rest it on the incisive papilla, and you can take a lip measurement of how far the lip goes on here. And I usually will make my wax rim about two millimeters lower that, uh, than the measurement that's given by clinician because you also want to be able to correct the horizontal plane. If it's right at the measurement, it might not give you enough uh, ability to correct that horizontal plane. Okay. Now we know that for younger people, lip, uh, you know, incisal display is going to be uh, more than for older people. For females, it's going to be a little bit different than for males, and things like this. So you should account for those things when you're fabricating your setups, as well as your what, as your as well as your bite trim, so you don't have to adjust them too much or having to add to them. Okay. Um, Things like this, utilizing their old denture uh, for measurements. Now, in my opinion, taking a replica of this, taking a scan of this will work better, and then using that as the um, as a custom tray um, to take a reline impression and to mount things, so you don't have to go through these steps. But sometimes that's not an option. So you can use an Alma gauge to measure in according in relation to incisive papilla. You can measure your horizontal distance as well as your vertical for your tooth position and for your wax room if you need to. Okay. Now that instrument is one thing I actually designed one on myself. I designed a file uh, that fits into one of these inexpensive digital calipers uh, that you can just print. Uh, the file is on Thingiverse um, uh, and you can fit it to that and you can utilize that to take those measurements as well. It's a, Think that that caliper digital caliper is going to be like 10 15 bucks on amazon file is free so once you print it you just have to mark those numbers on there so this will tell you the horizontal position according to the incisive papilla so from here you can see that the incisal edge on this um on this patient is uh going to be uh nine millimeters anterior of the incisive papilla and for vertical the incisal edge is going to be 14.4 from this point okay now when you're fabricating your wax rims you want to have a certain shape obviously uh on the anterior and the posterior as well you don't want it to be too wide and you don't want them to be too horribly narrow as well now on average you want your facial to be seven to nine millimeters from the middle of the size of papilla that's why i want to show you that measurement was about nine maybe a little bit more uh, you want the thickness of the rim to be eight and eight to ten millimeters in the posterior um, it, it's slightly less, it could be 
slightly less than the anterior, but the rims that I use, I use the uh, the Gebdi rims because they are really, really good shape. They're not too white. They're nice and hard, these uh, yellow ones, uh, and they actually smell like vanilla. Um, so it, and they work wonderfully chair side as well. But in the front, you want it to be about five to eight millimeters. In the back, you want it to be about eight to 10 millimeters, both top and bottom. Uh, a lot of times, clinically, what I do is I'll take a knife and I'll actually trim the uh, the palatal border of the rim to make it um, less aggressive. It makes it easier for patients to kind of associate it with the denture because the anterior ridge becomes more like a tooth setup. And also when you're checking phonetics, it's a little bit better. Um, but uh, when I start, I, I leave it thicker because I don't always know if it's going to be a uh, class one relationship or it's going to be class three relationship, things like that. Okay. This is a great tool. Okay. If you guys are not using this to uh, fabricate your wax rims or trim your wax rims chair side, um, you're missing out. Because the way it works, it has this nice little posterior lip. It allows you to sit it back on the hamular notch and it utilizes the concept of the hip plane, right? Hamular notch incisive papilla. So when you rest things on the hamular notch and you actually, when you heat it up, you don't slide it back and forth. You just start lowering it down to that 22 millimeters. On average, it becomes that hamular notch inside the papilla plane. So oftentimes you'll have the perfect campers plane and oftentimes you'll have a very nice horizontal plane as well. So you won't have to uh, adjust things barely at all, okay? And same thing for the bottom. When you flip, flip the plate, uh, plate over, you just rest it about two thirds up the retinal pad and you go all the way down to 18 millimeters and you get your really nice uh, campers plane here as well. In some cases, you'll get really overextended impressions as your final ones. And in those cases, what I'll generally do is I'll contact the clinician. And um, when I make the base plates, I'll trim them back to be able to take a wash impression with them to get a better to get better adaptation. And I can make wax rims like that. Another very, very nice step that you can include for the cases, and I think it's not an optional step. I almost look at this as a required uh, step in order to produce good restorations is going to be a Gothic arch trace. Now, back in the day, we we used these, you know, where we'd have to mount them individually for each case, and they're kind of not cheap, right? They're about 100 bucks uh, per per set, and you can only use them, I think there's like maybe one or two inside the set. You can use them for one or two patients, and then you have to sterilize, reuse them, and everything else. So then we started printing them and started adding metal components, and then we just switched completely to printed components. And I do those all the time, you know, and then... Uh, because you're making them digitally, uh, they, they fit the same model that you would make a wax rim to. And what I started doing is just sending, you know, upper or lower wax rims at the same time, sending uh, upper and the lower Gothic arch tracer. And sometimes you don't even need to, and no, don't even need a lower wax rim. Okay. And here I actually ended uh, uh, added an additional component, which is an, um, another metal plate, because oftentimes when I'm fabricating these Gothic arch tracers, I don't have a, um, a bite registration. So I'm just using anatomical landmarks. On the upper, I'll align it to the hip plane, which is close to a camper's plane. On the, and on the lower, I'll go about you know, 18 millimeters from the front and halfway up the retro molar pads and I use that plane. 90% of the time, I'm right there where I need to be. But sometimes every once in a while, maybe you wanna change the plane. And you can include one of these. You can just adjust with wax, or you can just print one and adjust it with wax as well. But ideally, you want to have some kind of mush bite, even or centric tray bite, in order to create the best possible Gothic arch tracer setup for cases. And basically, you're creating an error, right? When you you adjust it to proper vertical dimension, and you have your patient go forward and back, forward and back, side to the middle, side to the middle, and they create an arrow on it. And then you can capture, when they create an error, you can capture that bite registration either by drilling a little bit and having the patient close to that. Now, if you drill through the base plate and have them close, obviously you're gonna collapse the bite by about a millimeter. So you want to kind of add that to the articulator, uh, open the articulator down the line after that. Um, or you can just print a little washer, clear washer. You can add with wax to it and you'll have the perfect vertical dimension. Especially important with cases like this, where you're using a patient's existing denture and the patient has worn posterior teeth down quite a bit and caused severe issues with their bite. It's protrusive. It's no longer eccentric. 
And if you prosthetize them in, in this point, a lot of times what will happen, they'll start feeling that nice posterior occlusion that will relax and deprogram themselves. And all of a sudden you're stuck with what? An anterior open bite. So I see that sometimes as well, okay? With this case, we just use the patient's existing denture with digitally designed a new setup, trimmed all the teeth back except for the anterior six and incorporated gothic arch traces. So it's a very nice thing to do. You can see the interior aesthetics as well as uh, establishing vertical dimension and centric relation, okay? Here is just a different modification of that. That's something you can actually remove, take a nice wash impression with it, where with tongue movement, place it back in there, and then take your, uh, what? The Gothic arch tracer centric relation. Some of the things that you can use, you can use face bows. Not a fan of face bows, because they tend to be kind of problematic when it comes to ear canals sometimes. I like Koise analyzers a lot. If you don't have a Koise analyzer, this is actually my kind of modification for Koise analyzer. This is a, a knockoff version of the Japanese one because the uh, fox plane parts actually go up to go at the, at the um, campus plane so you can see if you need to adjust it. And you can actually put uh, a little uh, Koise plate on that as well when you modify it. Uh, and this is just a uh, one bite, which is kind of like almost a little bit like a stick bite. So there's a lot of ways you can capture things uh, for a uh, horizontal plane if you need to adjust it, if it's not a full denture or if it's an immediate. So things to consider, obviously you want to mark your midlines on the uh, on the bite trim. You want to mark your high lip line so you don't choose a tooth mold that's too short. And you want to mark, mark your uh, canine lines in order to choose the best possible selection for your, uh, for your tooth selection. Now, let's talk a little bit about model analysis, okay? Model analysis allows you to do a best possible setup and try to eliminate in some situations your crossbite. We're looking at landmarks and we can kind of see where we can place teeth and we can kind of see where maybe we shouldn't place teeth, okay? Now, it can be very complex as, as you can see this slide right here, um, and, but uh, I try to do a simpler version of it. Uh, you can actually do a very simple version of it. Um, but I'm going to show you a slightly more complex one. So remember when we talked about buccal corridors, like in some cases you want your buccal corridor to be right here, but functionally you can only place it right here. What model analysis allows you to do, it allows you to see how far buccally maybe you can shift things out without causing any issues or how far uh, maybe you want to bring it palatally. Okay. I don't generally have issues trying to bring teeth um, uh, palatal. I usually end up bringing them buccally because why? Because resorption of the, ma the maxilla goes upward and inward. So my maxilla is already resorbing this way. And I'm generally trying to bring things out in order to what? To fill out those buccal corridors. But sometimes if I go too far, the denture will destabilize and I'll end up with a middle, with the resorption of the denture, of the residual ridge and the crack through a denture as well. Okay. So when you're doing model analysis, you want to make sure your models are already mounted. So the first thing you do is you mark your incisive papilla, you mark your crest of the ridge, and you mark your um, uh, tuberosities. And if you take a mark through center of the tuberosities and through raphne palatini, you can kind of find your anatomical landmark for your what? For your midline. So your anatomical midline is there. So if your condition is lacking the ability to mark your midline in your wax rim, you can mark it this way. And a lot of times you're gonna be pretty close. Not always, but pretty close. Also, if you look at this, from the center of this incisive papilla, seven to eight millimeters or seven to nine millimeters actually, from that mark, facially is going to be your limit of how far you should be placing teeth. Now, if your wax rim shows you placing them further, it's not a problem. It's just something you want to double check on because a lot of times, especially more inexperienced clinicians, won't trim the facial wax and you're going to end up with a little bit of too much profile, especially if the technician also placed the anterior wax too far forward. Okay. Now, if obviously anatomical landmark here is a little bit difficult to establish because the Raphne palatini is not matching up with the incisive papilla. So obviously use your best judgment clinical evaluation, photo photographic evaluation, things like this, okay? Now for canine position, if the marks of the canine are not marked on the wax rim, uh, placing 
a points at the first major pair of palo rugae will give you a position of the middle of your canines. This is often seen in uh, in digital dentures. When you fabricate in digital dentures, full of digital dentures, uh, you'll you'll be asked for middle incisor papilla. You'll be asked for canine markings. So that's where you mark those canines, and you'll be asked for tuberosities as well. Now, for this, you're asked to mark the position of the first premolars. Now. According to model analysis, position of the first premolars is going to be the last major pair of palar rugae. Now, that's not always seen. So what I try to do is sometimes do it with a setup, and I can kind of measure things with a two size and put that position there, uh, just simply measuring millimeters. In order to get the best possible position for the upper teeth, for the palatal cusp, now we're only talking right now about the palatal cusp. If you draw a line through the position of the center of your first premolar, all the way through the middle of your tuberosity, that's going to be the most ideal position for palo cusps of your second premolar, first molar, and second molar. Pretty simple, right? If you need to, I don't know why you would, but if you need to move those teeth more uh, palatally, drawing that mark from the position of the first premolar to where the uh, pterygomandibular fold is, which is right about two millimeters palatal of the uh, uh, hamular notch, is going to be your limit of how far in you can move the palatal cusp of your first premolar, first, uh, uh, I'm sorry, second premolar, first molar, second molar, okay? But usually you're gonna be limited by what? By the buccal portion of the tooth. You can't just kind of slide it arbitrarily unless you just cut it off. So I don't generally utilize this part at all. And for the for the outer portion of things, there's two ways you can do it. One is complicated, it's kind of problematic because you would need to mark the position of the first molar and you can really only do that well if you have the case mounted in the class one relationship. The second one is very basic and it's the one that I use. It's going to be what? Your buccal vestibule. The buccal vestibule, the depth of the buccal vestibule is how far out you can move. Now, you, at this point, you're dealing with the buccal cusp. It's how far out you can move the buccal cusps of your second premolar, first molar, and second molar. Pretty simple, right? So there's only two things you need to remember for that kind of limit. Ideally, you want to go from the center of your tuberosity through your center of your first premolar. And that's your ideal position of the uh, palatal cusp. But if you need to move things buccally, as often you do, because what? Your mandible will resorb downward and outward. So your teeth are going to be set slightly outward because of that. And in order to avoid crossbite, you're going to have to move things outward a little bit. So using that buccal limit is going to be the best way to get it done. Okay. Now, this allows you to do what? Using this special expensive uh, compass allows you to transfer the position or rather the contour of your mandible onto the side of your cast. I basically just, when I do use it, I basically just use a $3 um, compass with a little bit of raw wire put into it with some pattern resin. So what that allows you to do, if you look right here, it allows you to see the lowest possible point of the crest of the ridge and you can mark it with a parallel line to it and that's going to be the middle of your largest masticatory unit which is what which is your first molar okay now there's some alteration you can go about a millimeter to distally a millimeter to measly in order to do what in order to close up any spaces that you might have and if you have a position uh, of uh, if you have a relationship of class one occlusion you can transfer that point for your palatal cusp of your first molar if you're using like Gerber lingualized occlusion, for example. Okay, there it is. So in the lower, we can see that's ideal position of the central fossa of the first molar. That's the mesial correction of it, and that's a distal correction of it. And here we can also see the position of our first premolar on the mandible as well. Okay, now you can go through this fancy kind of thing and determine the stop line uh, utilizing these templates or the rulers that I use. If you mark it on the lowest point, with this type of thing and go with the line with where the line of 22.5 degrees crosses your contour that's a stop line past which you do want to set any kind of occlusion okay 
That's the complex way. The simplest way that I usually utilize, look at your contours. Where it starts going up sharply, don't put any teeth in that point, okay? So this is a little close up, more aggressive one. But on me, I would have probably just kind of stopped my occlusion right here. So this kind of allows you to maybe go a little bit more distal. But for me, I think this just should have been enough, okay? Now, if you got a really flat contour, then you can pretty much go anywhere you want, except what, where it starts going up. And in this case, it's going to be your uh, retromolar pads. And the reason we stop there is because if you go past a certain point, you start pl placing vertical forces on there. You're going to destabilize your denture. It's going to go start going flipping up and forward. Okay, that's why you don't want to put any occlusion past that point. I'm often asked why you're only not using second molars. Why are you putting like two premolars and a molar? But actually, in my case, it's going to be uh, one premolar and two molars. Obviously, depending on each case. But I try to do two molars because it has a larger occlusal scheme and it's better for function okay so in the lower we mark the crest of the ridge that's going to be helpful retromolar pads we mark the halfway up this is a very important landmark the depth of the vestibule is how far forward you can not move the teeth forward but how far forward you can actually procline your uh, mandibular anterior teeth because if you go past a certain point it's going to destabilize things but the basal surface of your tooth should still be at the crest of the ridge, okay? Because the forces need to be transforming that direction. Okay, you can mark the anatomical midline. I never do this part because I generally just go by the uh, maxillary one. But here you can see that we marked the position of our first premolars, which are pretty much if you have buccal freedom, it's going to be slightly behind a buccal freedom. If you if those are not visible. We know that usually our canines are going to be where the arch starts to bend. And by taking measurements of the tooth mold, you can kind of calculate that distance for the center of the position of the first premolar. Okay. And then you're going to be utilizing your ideal lines, utilizing that position of, the, of your first premolar and utilizing pretty much the lines of your retromolar pads. That's another reason why it's important to have these things, right? So, ideal position. Now we're dealing with central fossa in this place. If we were Talking about maxilla, we're dealing mostly with uh, palatal cusps and sometimes buccal. But on the lower, we're only going to be dealing with buccal, uh, not buccal, with central fossas of our second premolar, first molar, second molar, whichever ones are going to be present. Okay. So ideal position of those central fossas are going to be center of our uh, of our retromolar path through the center of our first premolar. Okay. That's ideal position. If we need to move things outward we generally don't we usually unless we're trying to deal with buccal corridors and stuff like this because we're already resorbing outward right but if you need to move stuff outward you are also using that same center position of first premolar but now you're using your outer uh, buccal limit of your retromolar pads and for moving things lingually we're going to be using either our buccal uh, region of our retromolar pad or we're going to be using, if that's not very visible, you can also use the mylohyoid ridge for that position. So in the lower, if you look at the red mark, that's going to be your ideal position of the central fossa for the first premolar. Uh, for, I'm sorry, I apologize. I'm, for, for the second premolar, first molar, second molar, the green is going to be how far inward you can take that central fossa, and the blue is going to be how far out you can take that central fossa. Hopefully that makes sense, guys. Now, obviously, if you have a situation like this where your center of the ridge is here and your and your uh, retromolar pad is for some reason all the way on the lingual side, probably because it was a distorted impression, don't utilize that because your whole setup is going to be shifted, right? Um, and another thing, if you guys have like a thin, thin, knife-edged uh, mandibular ridge, it's not going to do you any good because all your corrections are going to be within like a one millimeter distance. So it's not going to create that big of a difference. Usually you want something that's got a nice wide ridge. Then you can actually use utilize those corrections in order to uh, eliminate uh, cross bites and things like this. So this is a little picture. The, you guys can take a screenshot of this later um, of the, all these limits that you're utilizing in order to move things inward and outward. It's a, a, it's a picture from the guys from Mertz. And they explain things a lot better than I do probably. But it's a nice picture to have because it talks about all these limits. Now here it, you can see that little buckle shelf that we talked about. That's how far out you can take things. 
you can see that this is the ideal center position. Oops, sorry. Ideal center position here. And then you can see how far out inward you can bring uh, things on the uh, on the maxilla. And same things that we just talked about on the mandible. So that's pretty much model analysis in a nutshell, guys. Um, our last portion, we're going to talk about occlusion and about teeth. Now, one of the couple of different combinations of things you can utilize. My favorite, the one is my go-to, the 99.9% the .9 of the cases that I set up, unless it's something else, well, let's say 95% of the cases, let's not go that, that aggressive, is going to be lingualized occlusion. Um, now, there are different ways you can do lingualized occlusion. You can go old school where you're using monoplane teeth on the lower and you're using a full anatomic tooth or a semi-anatomic tooth on the upper, as you can see right here. Uh, you can use um, semi-anatomic teeth or specifically fabricated lingualized teeth, which is what I use. I use lingua forms um, from Vita. So majority of my teeth that I utilize are going to be your Vita Penix cells for the interior and they're going to be your Vita lingua forms for the posterior. The reason that I'm a huge fan of uh, Vita Panic cells is because they're designed a little bit thicker on the incisal edges, and I do a lot of implant cases, and it's a lot better for you know wear and impact forces when you have a bulkier um, incisal area. Um, they will actually are less prone to cracking and things like this. Now you got your semi-anatomic occlusion that a lot of people use, and you got your full anatomic one. Now for full anatomic ones, I don't generally recommend doing it for uh, full dentures, unless you have a really, really aggressive ridge and you can kind of get away with it. Uh, majority of people use semi-anatomic. I think the difference is the cusp angulation. I think if you go above, I don't want to lie here, but as far as I remember, it's either 20, 25 degrees above that, then you are, uh, then you're going to be a fully anatomic. I hate doing monoplane or flat plane occlusion, either curved or uh, non-curved. It's just there's no efficiency at all. For, uh, for these patients. Sometimes we have to do it when you have a really unstable bite and there's no time to do any kind of therapeutic things and they just want to get it done and get it over with. So sometimes we'll do monoplane, but majority of cases, I'll do lingualized occlusion because it's the simplest thing to do in my opinion. It, you, you end up um, correcting one thing. You're working with the central fossa of the lowers, right? Are you going to make it wider if you want to have a little bit more immediate side shift? If you have interfering contacts, you can make it a little bit wider for that. Um, and the older patients have, the older patients are getting, they need a little bit more of that side shift. You don't want to lock them in. And, uh, you know, Mark Wagon still talks about freedom of movement all the time. I took his course, wonderful course, by the way. Uh, he talks a lot about that freedom of movement. And these uh, lingualized occlusion teeth are a lot easier to adjust for those kind of things. Okay. Now, there's a couple of different types of lingualized occlusion. When you're dealing with Gerber lingualized, your condyliform teeth, for example, they're going to be slightly reversed. Now, with those teeth, you're utilizing, if on your first premolar, you're utilizing the central fossa of the uppers and you're utilizing the, um, the cusp of your lower. And on, on all the other teeth, the relationship is the same as with any other lingualized occlusion. I don't generally do Gerber lingualized. Like this picture right here was done in Gerber lingualized. I'm not a fan of the aesthetics of Gerber lingualized occlusion. Like, dead on Gerber because there's a lot of like black triangles and things like this because it's a tooth to tooth relationship a lot of times it's not a two to one unless I'm wrong maybe I didn't know something please correct me if I'm wrong I, I have been wrong in, in the past for sure now overbite over jet an important step in my opinion uh, not to be beating a dead horse but Denture teeth are not natural teeth, right? They're not anchored the same way. They're not made of the same material, even if we're dealing with strong teeth. They're not made to withstand lateral impacts, okay? And um, also, mandibular and maxillary anterior bone, so anterior maxillary mandible. Not as much mandible, but, uh, more, uh, but maxilla for sure. That bone is... Poor, more porous and resorbs a lot faster. You can see in this case when the uh, posterior occlusion got worn out and the patient's actually biting a lot on the anterior. This case came back for a reline. Look how much resorption we got in this area versus that area. Okay, that's why the incisal um, overbite overjet overjet is important. Okay. Also, when you're losing posterior occlusion and we start beating on the anterior teeth, I don't care how great those teeth are unless you're dealing with like zirconia or something uh, or full ceramic 
you're going to put lateral force in those teeth. And you're either going to start breaking those out. You're going to start chipping them. That's why you need that overbite over jet. It's very important to have. So semi-atomic and atomic balance seclusion. I don't do those very often. I used to do it in the past before I started doing lingualized. But the idea is you got your working and your balancing side. So when you're sliding into your, this is going to be your working side. You have occlusion here in group function. Uh, and on your balancing side, you're going to have occlusion on your palocusps working with either central zones or your uh, buccal cusps on the on the balancing side. Okay, you can see those marks right here. I'll tell you one thing for sure, guys. Taking pictures of that took forever because you're trying to balance the articulator while holding the camera. It's a nightmare. Okay, you can see right here another sliding balancing movement. And for protrusive, what I generally look for is I'm looking for tripodized occlusion. I'm not looking for all the teeth to be in contact because I'll be honest with you guys, in order to get that very well done uh, and capture that in an articulator, you don't just need a regular bite registration. You don't just need um, conjular registration. You also need a protrusive bite registration because if you don't have that angle set exactly correct, it's going to look way different in the mouth. And also tissue stabilize and things like this, you're going to be doing readjustments in the mouth after two weeks anyways. So what I'm trying to do from this point, I, I try to approximate things. And for me, getting contact in the front and one or two contacts in the back is sufficient enough for stabilization and protrusive. And when you finish it up, you know, this is a little bit more aggressive wax up. This is more of a, let's take a nice picture wax up. It's not a very practical one. I used to do these all the time when I was a younger technician, um, but oftentimes we started smoothing things out. Um, in this particular case, we're using, we're using Fenerites and using their posteriors. That's going to be your semi-anatomic occlusion. I generally use lingualized posteriors and um, vitapatic cell teeth. Um, I don't recommend my personal recommendation. Nothing wrong with this particular tooth. But with Fenair teeth, uh, with Fenairs, the um, Fenairs, am I using the name correctly? There was a physiodens. I get, I get no, physiodens. Yeah, I'm sorry. Fenaris or Vita. I apologize. I don't use this tooth very often. I, I messed up the name. Yeah, physiodens. Uh, they have a slightly thinner incisal edge in comparison to Excels. So it'll be a good aesthetic tooth and a good tooth for a full denture. But if you're dealing with like with a hybrid or something, you're slightly more prone to getting these chipping things if you're going to have a thinner tooth in the front. And also with these type of teeth, you're uh, with any kind of Vita tooth, except for MFTs, uh, and I'm not sure about Vigos, but uh, Aphesiodans and Excels and Vita Pen Plus teeth, they're all going to have that ceramic filler in it, making a very, very abrasive resistant tooth. Um, but when you're dealing with a lot of ceramic, you know, it's more prone to, to chipping than when you're dealing with just an acrylic tooth. So you win some, you lose some. I still prefer using a this tooth to any other tooth because I have techniques that I utilize when I'm flasking things that you can either use a little bit of putty on the facial of the teeth. I generally just use the same technique that we're using in 1950s and 60s when using porcelain teeth. So when I do my second pour of, of stone, I make sure to open up the occlusals and the incisals of the teeth before doing my third pour. That way when I'm deflasking, I'm not putting extra lateral forces on these teeth and not causing any craze lines or anything like that. If you guys want to know more about that, let me know. I'll make sure to uh, let you show you pictures of or video of what I do from that point, okay? Now, uh, when it comes to my lingualized occlusion setups, we're using Excel teeth. These are going to be your Excels. Uh, basically, I set up my front six and my first bicuspids on the upper. That kind of gives me the idea of where to set my... Uh, plane of occlusion because I need two points in order to establish my plane of occlusion when I'm setting teeth, okay? So once I've set those six, I'll set up my anterior six and my first bicuspid in the lower, give me that first point of my occlusion for the mandible. Now, for the anterior six on the mandible, I will utilize and make sure that I have the proper overjet. But the overbite position, I don't worry about when I'm setting those up because it will change when I'm starting going into protrusive movements in order to correct it, okay? So once I've established this occlusal point, I'll set up all my posterior teeth going up 
about halfway up to three quarters of the retro molar pad right here, as you can see. So now I have my all my lower teeth set up. Now my overbite is not correct yet, but my plane is correct right here. And from here, I will set up my upper posteriors. Why do I set up my lower first? It's very simple, guys. If you look at your mandibular ridge, you're way more limited of how far in or out you can go on the mandible versus maxilla a lot of times. Not always, but a lot of times. So for me, it's easier to align things on the mandible first and then align the uppers to the lowers in the posterior. And you have that very nice curve of speed going on there in order to uh, stabilize protrusive movements. Then from here, what you do is you uh, start adjusting your uh, lowers in order to create proper um, overbite as well as overjet in order to do what? When you're going in a protrusive, you have that nice sliding movement on the interior, stabilizing things in a protrusive bite, as you can see. I don't have that right here. Sorry. As I, There's a picture that I took. I just didn't put it in here. I apologize. You're going to have contact in the front and at least one or two contacts in the back, just like with Sam Anatomic. And on here, you can see that we have a, a, a uh, just the buccal cusp that's going to be uh, working here. The the uh, You don't have the ABC contacts. You just have the palatal cusp of the maxilla working against the central fossa of the mandible, okay? As you can see right here as well. Oh, actually, no, I do have that picture. Sorry, I just didn't take it from the front. I took it from the side. So this is in protrusive. So you have a, your contact here. You have your contact, well, kind of contact on the canine. And you also have your contact on your um, uh, first molar. And I think it was on a premolar as well. And actually, it was on this premolar as well. So I got two contacts in the back, and I got uh, one or two contacts in the front. Uh, in protrusive, which makes it a lot more stable, and then I'll adjust it down the line from here. So that's pretty much my occlusion that I utilize in a nutshell. So I showed you guys a little bit about semi-anatomic, and this is uh, this uh, semi-anatomic bilateral balance, and this is lingualized occlusion in group function. I don't do bilateral balanced occlusion, guys, because bilateral balanced, in my opinion, is only necessary when you have a patient with a severe part function where they're just constantly grinding their teeth during the day and you want to give them a little bit of stability that are not so they're not putting that extra um, forces and inflammation on the residual ridges but at the same time there's also another a school of thought if your dentures are more destabilized with an important function maybe the patient won't be you know grinding on them as much so that's the kind of thing I like Excels a lot, guys, and like I was saying you, I was telling you, I utilize them a lot in my hybrids. I've been doing it for a couple of years. I really like the aesthetics and I really like the wear. Um, some people will say, you know what, they don't like these little, you know, developmental grooves. I tell them, you know what, if it's an issue when you're doing your polishing, just over polish it a little bit. It'll be as flat as you want it to be. Uh, but for me, I really like those little areas because they will break down the light and they'll actually make the teeth look more alive rather than looking fake okay so we've covered model analysis we've covered impressions we've covered occlusion uh, we covered all the basic uh, areas of what i wanted to talk to you guys about today for uh, making a denture that's going to be the most possibly aesthetic as well as functioning in your uh, patient's oral cavity so i think we're going to stop here with the lecture if anybody's got any questions i'll be more than happy to try to answer them all right, thank you, Eugene. Uh, appreciate that. That was really comprehensive and very, um, for me, it was very interesting uh, to go back through all of the landmarks and, you know, to reiterate all the important points of uh, setting up your denture correctly. Yeah, sometimes we forget the basics, and that's what gets us in trouble. <laughs> exactly. Eugene's got a couple more uh, down the road. We've got a couple uh, hands-on workshops, remote workshops going on. Uh, August 4th, August 5th, Eugene's coming uh, down to California to do a uh, hands-on workshop, which is going to be really great. That'll involve uh, implants uh, mm -hmm. as well. So that'll be a nice uh, in-person workshop here in Southern California if you want to uh, take a trip here in this location. Uh, otherwise, on our Vita uh, to North America YouTube channel, there are a bunch of other webinars that we've co recorded with Eugene. Uh, but I hope to see you again uh, at some other later date on webinars down the road.
Uh, as I mentioned, Eugene's got some uh, setup, hands-on setup uh, programs uh, scheduled, but also we do um, try and do a couple virtual hands-on where that we will uh, send you, if you register, we will send you some model sets in which you re will utilize, and then uh, throughout a two-day period or so, uh, we will, Eugene will go through some step-by-step -step and have you set up things and, and reiterate some of the highlights that he did uh, through this webinar, which will be uh, really nice. If, you are, if you're interested in that, uh, I know these dates are incorrect here, but uh, down the road we will have this uh, going on. Uh, if you need to get a hold of a local rep, feeder rep, this is the information. When you review the, uh, the webinar, you can take a snapshot of that as well. The help desk, uh, myself, Paul Richardson, if you need to get a hold of us. Uh, otherwise, this is uh, Eugene's information, and I did go ahead and I captured your um, barcode, mm -hmm. and I had to split it up because it's lengthwise on my phone, but uh, also here's the information. If you did have to barcode it on your phone or if you do on your uh, when you review the webinar, this is what you'll get. So let's go to, let's go to questions, uh, if you don't mind, Eugene. Sure. And let's here we have uh, several questions uh, is start with the top here uh, how does scanning affect the loading the tissue how to scan um, you know what I haven't had any issues with it um, also it's very dependent on what kind of scanner you guys are using if you're going to use something that's going to be not very precise um, that's going to cause some problems but also I actually learned this not too long ago. A um, couple of things. If you're scanning intraoral and using that, um, I'm not a fan of scanning intraorally and using that to fabricate the definitive appliance, unless you're using like an immediate or something like this. Um, you're gonna get like the, the most mucostatic possible scan when you do that. Um, so there's pros and cons there. I'm not gonna go deeply into it, but uh, uh, my personal favorite is to scan to create uh, a custom tray. Now, the one thing I learned recently, if you're scanning an impression to fabricate a model uh, digitally, um, the fit is a little bit less uh, ideal than if you're scanning a stone cast to fabricate a digital restoration. And I think it has to do with the expansion rates of... Uh, of the stone and the contraction rates of the impression material and so stuff like that. So that's that's one thing. Um, but my usual go-to when I when I work, I'll fabricate a stone cast, and from there I'll fabricate uh, a base plate or a custom tray, whatever you can do. I'll fabricate those digitally, and I get really really good results from that personally. All right. And a follow-up question was uh, you kind of mentioned it just there. Uh, have you started to print your uh, impression trays you know uh, custom ones yes uh, I, I do but sometimes I'll actually do a print of uh, a stock tray if it's just not you can take a stock tray you can scan it uh, if it's not wide enough or narrow enough you can adjust it if you wanted to I know people that do that but if you use plastic stock trays you can just melt those and bend them however you need to uh, our friend Dan, Dan is, I rarely see the um, metallic muscle on a cast. Is that a uh, poor impression or just hard to identify? Um, no, I, I generally don't have, I think it probably your impression is kind of too pressed in. Uh, I did, one, of the, one of the things that I see easiest in, in my cases is the metallic muscle. Um, now, sometimes they're kind of faint. Um, but you can see the shadowing of them fairly easy. I mean, we can I can send you some pictures of of cases and um, show you them um, where the areas are of the folds for the mentalis muscle. Maybe we just need to kind of uh, re revisit it a little bit, or maybe need to adjust the impression techniques. I mean, I guess if you take a really really aggressive impression, like I showed you guys with that pink cast, yeah, then it's probably not, you're not going to see anything. But uh, with majority of my cases, I can kind of see the outlines of what I need to for the mentalis muscle. 
Now for the for the uh, for the buckle landing area maybe not well, for the free now maybe not for, but um, a lot of times my uh, retromolar pads are going to be distorted but more more often than not uh, the buckles are, are still there i mean uh, the metal muscle is still there so for those dentists that may have difficult taking an impression correctly mm -hmm. uh do you ever send them a step-by-step -step or a reminder of the, the points that you need from that impression, uh, illustrations or? So basically what I do um, with with the doctors that I work with uh, as, as a lab technician, um, generally those doctors are prosthodontists. I'm kind of limited myself over the years, um, self-imposed limitations, <laughs> practice limited to prosthodontists. Um, uh, those guys I generally don't have any problems with. Every once in a while, I'll get a phone call and going, you know what, I haven't been getting great results with it. What can I change to do things? And I can send them pictures or videos of, of what I do. Uh, because I also teach at the American Insurance College. I have a, quite a few uh, videos that I do for the students there. So I can just kind of share those with them. Um, but majority of the doctors that I deal with that are somewhat inexperienced are going to be with the, uh, the, the general practice residency. And with those doctors, I'll actually be their chair side and show them all those necessary steps uh, to better their technique. All right. Um, are you using a new uh, neocolloid from Ivacar? Uh, they used to mix it with uh, blueprint, and they weren't blending together. Uh, you know what? I've Any never used Ivacar stuff. Um, I just used this. Um, Neocolloid and uh, Hydrogon 5 um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, that's the first one I've tried and it worked really well for me. Uh, number two, in comparison to Ivoclar, I think it's cheaper. Um, so that's also a very, very good selling point. And the quality um, of bonding between the, the Hydrogon 5 and Neocolloid is, is really good. So, sorry, I haven't used the other one. I can't tell you pros and cons on that. When you leave off a premolar and set both uh, molars, which premolar do you usually drop off? A uh, second premolar I usually drop off because uh, aesthetically, uh, the first premolar is going to line up a lot better with the canines. Uh, also, it has a smaller profile, so it doesn't jump out at you as much. Um, uh, it does have a smaller occlusal print, uh, but you compensate for that from using two, two molars instead. Uh, do you see a posterior? Do you see? Do you set posterior teeth in a straight line or arch them if the ridge is curved? Um, I was taught to do straight, but there's different schools of thought. Um, to me, it has a more pleasant uh, aesthetic look that way because I don't like to look at the buccal corridors and see. Uh, my molars be more out than my premolars. It kind of looks like there's a step there, unless you curve them perfectly, I guess. Maybe I just haven't learned the, the perfect curving technique. Uh, but uh, I was just taught to, to go with straight lines and that's what I've been doing over the years. Now, if you have a really severe discrepancy in the ridge and it, it does curve that way, then yeah, obviously you want to set it because you also limit it um, where your tongue space and everything else like that. So maybe you want to curve it in order to accommodate your residual ridge uh, from that point. All right. Uh, for balanced occlusion, mm -hmm. uh, doesn't it need the molars ramped uh, curve of speed? Yeah. Also, uh, patients are asked to uh, load their bowls of food on both sides. This is so foreign. Um, is so foreign to explain to patients as well trying trying to accomplish this yeah so i if you look at my setups and if you go back through the video you can see that it actually does have a curve of speed uh in there so when you're setting up uh, when you're setting up your first premolar at that point and you go up to three quarters of the molar pads it creates that curve of speed and the actual teeth themselves if you look at the first premolar it goes from this point and goes down and then it, 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 it's just the tooth mold itself kind of creates it almost there. You can exaggerate it if you wanted to by 
especially if you're using two molars, by dropping that molar downward a little bit by the first premolar, and then um, and then taking your second molar and creating that uh, angulation slightly larger, you can create a more aggressive curve of speed uh, from that point. But it's it's more of an individual thing, in my opinion. If you're having a trouble uh, getting your proper tripodized occlusion and protrusive, you might want to think about a, creating a more aggressive curve of speed. As far as the bilateral balanced occlusion, asking patients to uh, bite on both sides, I, I would recommend you uh, look at your own personal uh, um, way of your eating. Majority of us chew on one side. Now, some of us, like me, chew on one side because uh, we don't have proper occlusion on the, um, on the other side. We can't bite really well. But a lot of us, even if you have a nice uniform occlusion uh, bilaterally, majority of us will favor one side rather than the other. So I just don't, it's my personal opinion, and I could be very wrong, and I apologize if you don't agree with me, but it's just I don't think bilateral balanced occlusion uh, is needed for these type of restoration, unless, maybe unless you're dealing with a severely, um, uh, Severe malocclusion issues where the patient is constantly just grinding during the day. Uh, can you elaborate on what you mean by doing bilateral balancing? So bilateral balance occlusion is when you actually have a working and a balancing side. So when you shift your jaw to one side, when you slide it to right or the left, you're going to have one side of teeth that's touching at the same time as the other side of teeth is touching. Okay. Uh, but there's a there's a very very uh, common saying out there. It's called bolus in balance out. So when you're uh, presenting a piece of food when the patient's biting down on this side, they're not going to be biting on the other side. Hence, there's no need for that. Now, if you have a patient that doesn't have any food in there and slide their jaw all over the place because of some kind of you know grinding issue, then yeah, that, that that's when the balancing occlusion can come into play. Okay, in my opinion, the group function. When you're just sliding to one side and all the teeth in this side that you're showing on are working at the same time, works a lot better. When landmarks are difficult to identify mm -hmm. and you're left with using average uh, values, uh, is there a, a, a deviation? Do you, have you learned to deviate any specific average value that works better than another or do you just stick with the average so published when you're when you're looking at uh, there's a couple of things that we get used landmarks for one of the major ones in the beginning we're going to use it to fabricate a custom tray right so if the landmarks are difficult to identify there's two things that i will do i will approximate things in the lab while fabricating the tray and then when i'm looking at things chair side i'll do two things i'll look visually where my when i'm moving the patient's tissues where they will extend to and i'll trim the tray from that point and the secondary thing that i do is i'll utilize instead of using fit checker which is quite expensive i'll just use like light or extra light viscosity impression material um, the cheaper the better actually because you're just using it to check things and i'll place it on the periphery of the tray place it in there and i'll start going through the movements and wherever you see things perforate through the impression uh, and, and you can see the tray from that point, that's where I'll trim the tray. Coincidentally, I use the same technique when I'm delivering the case uh, to see if, if there are any overextensions on my maxillary or mandibular denture. Now that's for the custom tray and for delivery. Uh, for, the, um, for the actual tooth setup, if I'm not seeing the, uh, you know, the buccofrina, if I can't see where it is and place my position of my first, uh, premolar to that point, then I will uh, I will use the size of the tooth to determine where that position is for the for the lines. Uh, now, if you are not seeing the retromolar pads in your impression, then it's a problem. Um, generally, it's a problem because it's just not because it's distorted or overcompressed. It's because it hasn't been captured. I see a lot of impressions. The retro pads are not present, and as you saw in those videos and, and, and on the presentation, I'm using compound to add things to it to uh, actually capture it in order to provide a good stable uh, denture for the patient and maybe even get suction. Hopefully, yeah, that, that might be a 
might be a critical landmark. Yeah, just a little bit. Uh, okay, uh, thanks for asking, answering the questions. We've got one more. Um, uh, is certain lower lip muscles, uh, the movement of them, activating the mentalis muscle? Well, uh, you probably do. Oh, you're kind of catching me off guard. It's been a while since I took my boards. Um, thinking that bicularis oris might uh, might affect it, but I, you know, I plead the fifth. And please don't yeah. tell my instructors I said that because I just I facial anatomy. You kind of learn it for the uh, for the exams, and then you kind of uh, yeah, yeah, I know this stuff sort of thing. If you give me five minutes uh, to grab my books, I, I will be more than happy to tell you that I know exactly what they do and how they do it. But basically, if you take a uh, take a look at the screenshots uh, down the line, those two pictures, which movements you need to do in order to capture the best possible um, impressions uh, for your maxilla and the mandible, my go-to. Um, usually if you i have the patient go o and e and so when you're doing the e movement you will definitely uh contract those mentalis muscles and you get those extensions as well as the o movements as well uh will form that uh facial uh portion so the e is going to be the shortness and the o is going to be the flatness of things so since mentalis deals with the shortness uh, it's going to be the E movement for it. And then there's other ones, the tongue pressing and the movement side to side and swallowing and all, all those fun ones. One thing that I didn't cover, and I, I think I should have, please, unless you're doing like a duplicate denture, if you're doing a lower custom tray, and nowadays it's a lot easier when you're doing it digitally, please place a finger rest on the custom tray. Because what happens is if, you're, if you have your fingers too low in the patient, unless you're using like a BPS technique or a, uh, or a, a duplicate denture technique, you're going to have your fingers in the patient's mouth holding the uh, custom tray and uh, and having it actually close into your fingers so you have less uh, less distortion on the retromolar pads. Now, if your fingers are too far down on the tray and you're trying to have the patient go OE and you're actually, actually trying to pull their uh, buccal tissues onto uh, towards the, uh, the lingual, your finger's going to be in the way and it's going to create a much larger uh, uh, role in the area of the vestibule, making things overextended. So by placing those little finger rests that you can do digitally in there, or if you're not doing digital custom trays, just take a little bit of that tray material and place it on there. You're going to avoid that and get a much better uh, way of, um, of capturing that peripheral role. But ultimately, a closed impression technique is the best, unfortunately, guys. So that's kind of a kind of a shout out to the BPS guys. Well, you know, that, that sounded like a, an answer to me to the question. So you did a good job. <laughs> Thank you. you. You passed your boards again. Okay. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Eugene, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to, uh, you know, train, educate uh, everyone out there, whatever, whatever their level may be. I uh, greatly appreciate your uh, thoughts and comments and, and helping as a community, help them understand and become better technicians, better denturists, and so forth. So, and and, and Dan, um, just one more one more thing, Dan. If you just contact me, we can I can send you some pictures of the of the impression, not impressions, but on the models that I have, and the mentalis been kind of shown on that. That might be able to help, and we can take a look at your impressions, and we can try evaluate the situation, and maybe have adjust the impression techniques. Yeah, make sure uh, everyone that you do have access to Eugene. He's been gracious enough to provide a uh, an email and a phone number. Uh, remember, he is uh, working every day hard uh, for himself and his family. And you know, uh, if he doesn't get back to you right away, just make sure you you give him some time to respond. It just means I blocked you guys, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> So um, thank you very much, Eugene. Thank you very much uh, for everyone that attended. Um, please join us again for another uh, Vita Academy uh, webinar in the future. And we will call this a day. So this will end today's webinar. Thank, thank you, you so for much. Joining us. Thank you.